Spike, how's it going, man? It's going great, Matt. Thanks for having me on, man. So you've been uh, sort of relentlessly on the road speaking to uh, state libertarian parties. I'm, I'm sort of following you. How many have you done so far this year? This year I've done, gosh, four. I've done uh, Tennessee, uh, Georgia, Alabama, and I would just got back from Oklahoma. I've also done some remotely. I did Massachusetts and a couple others that I'm forgetting at the moment. Uh, but in person, I've done I've done those four. My next one's going to be in Alaska in a couple weeks. Cool. Are you physically going to Alaska? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm going to Wasilla. It's my first time in Alaska. I'm pretty excited. All right. So I'll make sure to say hi to Sarah Palin for us. I will, I will do so. And I'll say hi to Russia. Hopefully I can see it from wherever I am. Yeah, I, I suspect so. But so I, I want to get into a bunch of stuff, but I, I first I wanted to talk to you about the issue of the moment, um, so-called uh, passport uh, vaccine passports. Yeah. And and I've been uh, I've been talking about this for a couple of months, and I, I I very much see a pathway to a Chinese social credit system, and I don't I don't think that's hyperbole. I think this idea that we would uh, organize society based on your on your health or lack thereof and and yep. and deciding whether or not certain citizens are allowed to do things that that sounds more like chinese communism than than in the america i know where are you on this so I think that it is not hyperbole to say that this is what it would lead to. The vaccine passport itself isn't that yet, but it's the infrastructure needed to be able to create create that. And it's also the social infrastructure, the idea, embedding the idea that you're either clean or not clean, vaccinated or not vaccinated. As someone that just traveled the country, last year I went to 35 states, uh, nearly uh, roughly 100 campaign events, came well within six feet of tens of thousands of people, was routinely tested to make sure I wasn't you know, being a typhoid Mary, spreading it around the country, and came back negative every time. I can safely say that even unvaccinated, with just some basic safety protocols, like washing your hands on a regular basis, uh, not getting it directly in people's faces, not eating after people and not drinking after people and stuff like that, you can have a hyper- uh, uh, traveling and interactive experience uh, in person with people and still not get the virus. So there's there's simply, there's no justification for what they're talking about where you won't be allowed in uh, certain venues. And a lot of people, because it's a passport, people are focusing on the travel aspect. They're not focusing on, they're talking about whether or not you're allowed in Walmart, whether or not you're allowed in school, whether or not you're allowed into a, a disaster shelter during a natural disaster or an abuse shelter. Imagine if abusers knew that all they needed to do was keep their victims from getting vaccinated and they couldn't go anywhere to get away from them. This is a terrible, terrible idea. And there's a focus on, well, okay, but it's coming from the private sector. It's not the government doing it. Even if we put aside all the government guidance that's coming in with this, let's say it's a fully private venture. Do they have the right to do it? Sure. And we have the right to criticize them and say what they're doing is harmful. Yeah, the, the um, I, I think it's totally sort of a, I stopped watching Black Mirror, by the way, because it was depressing me because it felt too real. It was, maybe it was like that, a post-documentary, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's just my paranoid libertarianism coming out, but I'm like, this this feels too close to home. And, right. and that, that was, of course, way before all of this. But but the, the, the article I read in the Washington Post makes it very clear that the Biden administration and all of these faceless bureaucrats from HHS and, and uh, the CDC and other places, they are very much orchestrating this effort from the top down. Right. And- Predictably, there is a number of government contractors, uh, ostensibly private businesses, that are that are looking for the business. They would love to get this account to actually create sort of this this national social credit system. Um, and I, I draw the distinction, like I think this this argument, and a lot of libertarians are having this argument, like is this is this a private action or is this a government action? Right. And I think in, in reality, it's either government ownership of the apparatus, government ownership of the means of production, right. or it's government control of the apparatus, right. government control of the means of production. And as a libertarian, I don't want either one of those things. Right. Even if it was a fully private thing, again, we can still criticize it and say that this is leading us down a very, very bad path that none of us want to go down. But once you factor in the 
and they keep calling it guidance, but they're event, event, basically building the infrastructure and the framework by which they'll be able to create this so-called vaccine passport thing. So to call it a fully private thing is, is simply false. It, 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 there's, it's a public-private thing, which interestingly enough, public-private partnerships are corporatism. And of course, corporatism is the economic plank of fascism. So, it, you know, we, we are definitely going down a road we don't want to. Another very interesting thing here, Matt, is that when you look at the timelines for when this thing would even be implemented and, and be able to be used by anyone, this will be several months after we've reached herd immunity. So they're not building it for COVID-19. They may use it for COVID-19, but they're not building it for COVID-19. So why are they building it? If, if we know that sometime in May or June, something like 75 to 80 percent of people are either going to be vaccinated or will have already gotten COVID-19, then we already know that there isn't a pandemic concern anymore with COVID. Why are they making this? Why are they putting all this time into it? And that lends itself to your, as you called it, libertarian paranoia, otherwise known as uh, you know, being able to look ahead to the future of what it is they're building it for. And that's a lot more scary than anything we're even talking about right now. Yeah, I was on a uh, in a uh, clubhouse room with Justin Amash yesterday, and he tells the story as a member of Congress how all of the things that were ostensibly designed to protect us from terrorists morphed into a broad sweeping system of domestic surveillance. Yep. And you you have to appreciate this is sort of politics 101, public choice, if you want to call it that. Whatever sort of theoretical um, uh, system you could come up with that would be purely private and non-invasive and protect our privacy. Um, I think those things would be difficult to achieve in the best of circumstances. But whatever you're thinking you might want the government to do, that's not how they work. That's not what they're going to do. Exactly. And it's it's going to turn into a thing. And I, I just read a article today on, on fee.com about the origins of the original passports, the ones we do use for travel. Um, those, of course, were temporary as well. Yep. And and 100 years later, here we are, yep. and we're just expanding those. So it's 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 frustrating to me that there's there's a lot of confusion out there that this is just about about traveling to another country, and it has nothing to do with that. Even if it was, that's still an issue. That's still a concern. Telling someone that you know doesn't have a, a, a smartphone app or that has a legitimate medical reason, like for example, a prior adverse reaction to vaccines, which would lead doctors to tell them not to get this vaccine, tells them that they can't leave the country, that's troubling enough. But again, we're talking about going to Walmart. This Excelsior Pass or whatever they're calling it in New York, they're talking about going to the store, going to schools, going to playgrounds and parks and stadiums and everything. In other words, being able to interact with other people in any real substantive way. This is terrible. This is a terrible, terrible idea. Public, private, I don't even care at this point. First of all, the, 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 the line, if there even is one, between the major crony corporations that are completely and entirely dependent on government and the government that exists to feed the, the troth for the crony corporate uh, uh, the, the crony corporate uh, or the major crony corporations, that line is so blurred to the point of not even existing anyway that it really doesn't even make sense to have that distinction. But again, even if it were fully private, this is still a terrible idea. It takes us down a bad path. And we talk so much about, for example, so many of the people that are upset about voter ID are upset about the fact that you are requiring that someone in order to vote uh, have to get an ID, which is something that many people either can't afford or have a hard time getting uh, you know, access to. Now, now we're talking about a smartphone app to be able to go to Walmart. Imagine the kind of discrimination that is inherent in something like this. And that's before you get into other countries that aren't going to have vaccination for several months or years from now. What, they're just not allowed to participate in the rest of society? Like, it's just a terrible idea. And as you said, whatever boogeyman they're using to scare you with, you know, with the, with the Patriot Act and with the 95 and 96 uh, anti-terrorism bills, it was the terrorists that are coming to kill you for your freedoms. Uh, it is, you know, uh, during the war on drugs, it was those drug dealers that are taking over your, your communities. It's always ends up being used against you and against people that you care about because Predators go after the easiest prey. You're probably the easiest prey because you're not a cartel owner. You're not the head of a terror group. You're someone who may, probably doesn't have the means to fight against you know, or, uh, government infringement on your rights and, and liberties. You're the target. You're always the target. Let's talk about the fear. And I, um, you, you triggered a thought. I noticed when I, I've, I've been traveling quite a bit as much as, as I'm legally allowed to, um, assuming things are open. And when I'm in the airport now, 
um, all of those uh, public service announcements that used to tell me to look out for potential terrorists and suspicious behavior, they're all gone. Yeah. And yeah. they've re been replaced with uh, how to properly wear your mask and yep. make sure you stand six feet away from everybody else. Um, and I think we're at that that part where what whatever the proper government response to the pandemic was a year ago, we're just into the fear-mongering phase yeah. of it. And, and it strikes me that um, the reason that the Biden administration, you know, Joe Biden is fully vaccinated. He doesn't need to wear a mask anymore, if, assuming that the vaccines work. Right. Um, but he needed it to pass $2 trillion in boondoggle spending that we don't have, a tiny fraction of which actually went to people and virus mitigation. He's, he's right. queuing up another $3 trillion and of course the vaccine passports. So it's 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 a, a shameless exploitation of a crisis that at this point is being manufactured by the government from my perspective. It is hypochondria as policy and not just as government policy, but as social policy. 15 days to slow the spread has turned into stay away from everyone that you care about until all disease is eradicated from mankind. Putting aside the, I'm not sure if it's Orwellian or Kafka-esque nature of being in a crowded airport where we are repeatedly told over the speaker by whoever the mayor of that town is that the airport's in, that we should all stay six feet away from each other. We can barely stay six inches away from each other. Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, when I'm in like Charlotte Douglas Airport or uh, Newark Airport or, you know, O'Hare, you're not, the, the odds of staying six feet Away, and then you get on the plane and you're you know well within six feet of like a dozen people uh, and, and they're repeatedly telling you to socially distance putting aside just the absurd nature of being told something that everyone acknowledges is fundamentally and physically impossible yeah it's backing up this sort of hypochondria of like you could get sick you could die if you don't listen to the government and that's really what it comes down to it's less about the mask it's less about the lockdown it's less about the specific policy and it's certainly less about the the virus itself than it is about this overwhelming idea this this, this overarching idea that if you don't listen to the government you might die and it, it, it goes back to how they always deal with things, whether it's terrorism or, or a pandemic or anything else. You create policies that either lead to the problem happening or make it worse. We know that the CDC and the FDA didn't allow testing for COVID for the first month plus that the virus was here, which is what allowed it to spread out of control. Then you had multiple state governments that were shoving COVID patients in nursing homes, which made the fatality rate go through the roof and freak everyone out. So you, you, you instill that fear through bad policy, either intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, you then leverage that fear to push for draconian policies. When those draconian policies inevitably do not work, you then blame it on the fact that you don't have enough power, and then you push for even more power. And then when that fails, you just continue a cycle of pushing for more and more power. So I, I want to pivot to uh, a tweet storm, a Facebook post you did recently talking about your, your seventh anniversary of, I guess, discovering that you had MS, although there was some time when you weren't sure exactly what was going on with you. And it it reminded me, um, your, your post was incredibly inspirational to me, and it reminded me a little bit of my own experience uh, surviving stage four cancer. And it 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 I, I view it in some ways as a motivating thing because I learned what it would like be like to to not have the time to do the things that I wanted to do. That, yeah, that was so, really that was really shitty, by the way. Are, are, are we starting over from scratch, or? Uh, no, I'll, I'll do. I'll just do it one more time. Sorry. I I have a virtually impossible time recreating anything. Um, so so let me let me pivot. Uh, you, you recently announced on Facebook. You told a story about seven years ago when you discovered that you had MS and the struggles that you went through and and the challenges in your life. And it, it reminded me a lot of, of my own personal experience surviving stage four cancer when I was in my 30s. Um, and not just the, the challenges, but but sort of the, the bounce back and the inspiration yep. that you had afterwards. And you're like, time is short, I need to get something done. Yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 I guess, tweet storm or, or it actually, it's interesting. It started, it was supposed to be a couple paragraphs, something that would fit in, you know, a shorter Facebook post or maybe like one or two tweets. And it ended up just becoming this long. I think I ended it by saying, wow, this is way longer than I thought it would be. Um, but the, uh, 
the basically what I was talking about, it was on the uh, seventh anniversary of when I was told that I more than likely had MS. It took another couple of years to get the official diagnosis, which is kind of standard for MS. But basically what happened seven years ago on, uh, on March 25th, 2014, I woke up and the right side of my body was numb, uh, barely any feeling at all. And, uh, you know, that, uh, no, actually that's not true. Uh, that was when uh, a couple weeks prior, I woke up and I was I, I was numb. And we went through. I went to multiple doctors, and you know they they ruled out a couple other things. I eventually ended up in an ER getting an MRI. And on uh, March 25th, I was told, yeah, you you have MS. You you definitely, or you more than likely have MS. And that really began a a process of for the better part of two years between the fact that my MS was uh, kind of out of control and also the fact that I was just battling with feeling lost and hopeless as a result of my diagnosis. Um, I was in a really bad place for like two years until eventually um, I, I finally got my diagnosis. We started talking about treatment options. And the interesting thing was the, uh, the doctors told me that the purpose the goal of the of my MS treatment was to try to slow down the progression of my MS so that it wasn't much different than just the standard aging process that we all go through. It made me realize that no matter what we're worried about, no matter what we fear, no matter what, no matter what good or bad things happen, 50, 100, 200 years from now, none of us are going to be here. And all that will matter is what we've left behind. Or did we help people around us? Did we make an impact around those around us? Did we help others who, that then inspired them to help others, that then inspired to help others? Did we create a ripple effect? Is the world a better place because we were here or not? And that's the only thing that concerns me at this point. I, I don't wanna say I'm fearless, but I certainly have far less fear than I used to have. And, and I'll never say I'm happy that I have MS, uh, it's a terrible disease. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. But I, but I will say that I am happy with the change in my outlook that has come from it. And yes, now when a politician tells me you need to listen to me or bad things are going to happen to you, I go, buddy, things have already happened to me. I'm not scared of it, and I'm not scared of you. And I know how to make smart choices for myself to make sure that those things don't happen. Yeah, I mean, I've, I, I think that I've described surviving stage four cancer um, not as a blessing, but it absolutely was liberating for me. Yep. Um, it, it changed my life perspective. And I, I was diagnosed in my 30s. And, and it, was a, it was a different progression than your story because I, I was pretty much given a death sentence. And I spent two weeks with my wife getting our finances in order and, and writing a will and, and, a wow. living will and all that stuff because I was waiting two weeks to, to get into a, um, a, a surgical table. And, and so I had, I had two weeks to sort of assess my life at that, at that point in my career. And, and this, this sounds silly. This sounds like a libertarian thing, but I kept saying to myself, I'm not done. Yeah. I got stuff to do. Yep. So when, when they finally cut me open and we discovered that it was a different type of cancer that could actually be treated, um, that, that was like, a, that's the beginning of a whole new life for me. Yep, yep. And and I'm definitely not fearless. I mean, if uh, fearless people probably are a little bit dumb, but <laughs> but it's it's a balance between you should you should be afraid of failure, but you shouldn't let it cripple you and you shouldn't let it stop you from taking risks and doing the things that you want to achieve in your life. And so when I talk to young people about, I mean, I can go into lurid details about about the struggle I went through, but yeah. the, the whole point of the story is live your life. You're you're in your 20s now. You think you're going to live forever. Guess what? You're not. You're not. Yeah. You got to go for it. Go for yeah. it. Live your life. Yeah, yeah. And and you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I think that was the the big takeaway for me, and it sounds like it was for you as well. I wasn't given a death sentence. MS is not a death sentence. It's a sentence of the possibility of having a greatly reduced quality of life, not too, uh, not too soon in the future. It, it, in, in very extreme cases, it can lead to a, a reduction in, in the overall lifespan. But I was in my 30s when I was being diagnosed. Now, I will say this. I had a very, very aggressive case of MS before my treatment and my, my dietary changes and exercise changes and really just really changing the way I was living across the board, retiring from my company and, and, and you know, 
relearning how to live uh, in, in, in couple, coupling that with the treatment that they also have me on, I was able to, I, I've now been stable. I, I recently had my, my most recent MRI earlier this month, and it's confirmed that I've remained stable for almost five years now, uh, just over four years. Um, but during that time in between then, before I started on my treatment and all my, my lifestyle changes, I was getting a relapse every couple months. And uh, it was pretty scary. Um, I, I, I didn't think I was gonna die soon, but I wondered how much longer I'd be able to see, be able to walk, be able to lift things, be able to live a normal life. And it's not a death sentence, but it's pretty darn close. And, it, and, it's, and it's scary because it's not a, well, there's a treatment that might actually get rid of it. It's, there's a treatment that might keep it at bay. So it's something that I continue to, you know, you mentioned that I, I beat it. I've certainly uh, beat the, uh, the the doom and gloom that many people get from it, and I've been able to keep it stable and and fight back against it. Um, but it's always it's still there, and until there's an actual cure, it will remain there. Um, and I still have, you know, I've learned to uh, to to live my life despite the various symptoms and, and difficulties that I have, but it's there. I'm reminded every day that it's still there, but I, I will say that it has taken away the, I guess, the superfluous fear. And now instead of fearing failure, I now relish the opportunity to be able to learn from when I fall short of victory. And I think that's a completely different way of looking at things. And it's really helped me. Yeah. And, and I, I, I think, I think in my case, the, um, you know, I, I beat cancer and I've been cancer free for far longer than the five years that, that's awesome. That's that required. Awesome. Um, wh usually when I tell this story, I'd lead with the spoiler that I lived to tell about it. But, <laughs> and, and people are relieved that I didn't die. Oh, thank but, God he did live. OK, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I did such a aggressive chemotherapy that I, I'm keenly aware that that's going to come back to damage my system again. It's just the way it is. But, you know, you're. You're you're buying time, but time is all we have, and and you want to maximize every minute of it, and that's that's kind of the point of this. Exactly. Um, the 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 thing that I I didn't I didn't really know your your backstory. We got to know each other um, quite a bit at the LP convention yep. last year, last year, the year before, whatever it was. I yeah, it time, was la last year in Orlando. Yeah. Time does not matter under COVID, so I don't even know what day or month it is at this <laughs> point, but. Um, I didn't. I didn't know that you had sort of left your business to pursue your your sort of passion, yeah. which is which is liberty. Um, talk about talk about your mission. I mean, I, I know you. I know you ran for VP, and I know you're still out there. But what's the mission? The mission is to see a world set free in our lifetime. That's the aspirational goal. I, I still think very much like a, a corporate guy because you know, you've got your aspirational goal, uh, your vision statement for lack of a better word. Uh, and then you've got your, your kind of your long-term, uh, I guess, pie in the sky goals. And then you start building out your brass tacks of, of how you're actually going to do it. My vision statement or aspirational goal is to work towards a world set free in our time. Um, and the brass tacks of how to get there is I believe that one of those vehicles for doing that is the Libertarian Party. There are also vehicles outside of it, just the greater libertarian movement, working with mutual aid groups to be able to provide an alternative uh, to government for people that are in need, both so that we can help those people and so that we can kill that argument that without government, we can't help people. Um, but as it relates to the Libertarian Party, I see a party that has everything it needs to begin winning much bigger than we, we've been winning. We, we have hundreds of elected officials at local and, and, and regional and even some state level uh, races, but we have all the ingredients there to be able to grow into a party that can contest elections all the way up to the White House and everything in between. What we don't have is the plan or the direction or the infrastructure, and, and I shouldn't even say infrastructure, the framework and the blueprint to be able to do that. Uh, we have what I consider a, uh, a, a, a culture of losing within the Libertarian Party. I think that it started as a, a coping mechanism that, well, you know, we, we had to cope with the fact that we would lose really, really big, even bigger than we lose now. And we had to kind of make ourselves okay with working long term for this long slog. But what's happened is we've kind of created this nesting mentality where we where we are being okay with losing. So we have this four year cycle. It starts right around now. 
you know, a few months after the, uh, the, the previous presidential election. And we get together and we start fantasizing about what's going to happen when we take over the White House and end the Fed and end the IRS and end the war on drugs and end the war on guns and end the wars overseas. And we're going to set everyone free and get government out of their lives. And we're all going to prosper and live much better and help happier and hate, uh, safer and healthier lives. And then we go through this for four years. We, we, we go around and we tell people from our perspective, the way we talk about things to each other, we talk to everyone else about their rights and their lives and, and, and you know how, how they should live better lives because they'll be free. And most people are going, yeah, but how is government going to, you know, how are we going to deal with education and health care? And we go, that'll work itself out. The free market will provide. We don't really answer how that will happen. And I'm speaking very generally. Not, not everyone does this, but generally speaking, we don't break down how it is. When someone asks us, well, how are we going to have roads? We laugh at them because how, what a silly question. Instead of answering their question, because they have a very legitimate concern about whether they'll have roads and hospitals and schools and parks and everything else. Um, and we... Um, we have a strategy of getting on the debate stage and then everyone's going to have this, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, come to Jesus moment, uh, or if you're not religious, you know, come to, come to Liberty moment, moment, whatever. And, uh, and when that happens, then we're going to win the white house. And none of that happens. We don't get on the debate stage cause we don't poll well, if they even poll us at all, we poll in the margin of error and, uh, we don't really get our message out there cause crony corporate media has no interest in uh, giving a platform to people who want to tear apart what allows them to control the market share of everything. Uh, and so we score 1%, 2%, 3%, half a percent, whatever. We, we, we don't win. We don't even get 5% to make, make minor party status. We just lose. Uh, and we win some races, but we don't focus on that. We, we focus on the fact that we lost. And then we go, oh, the whole system's rigged. Uh, we're never going to win. Uh, the, 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 the crony corporate media will never give us a chance. We'll never be on the debate stage. This system's rigged. Uh, you know, th th there's nothing we can do. And then we lick our wounds over the holiday season. And then we come back for convention season, which is starting right about now, where we begin the process of fantasizing all over again. In between that, we also fight each other because we don't have actual set goals. We don't have anything to work towards. We just have this big aspirational goal and none of us really have any direction on how to do it. So we start blaming each other. It's your fault we don't win. Uh, you're too radical. No, it's your fault you, we don't win. You're too milk toast. And we fight each other instead of actually having goals. And so what my goal is, is to work, and this is why I'm going across the country, is to work with local and state affiliates to identify candidates and initiatives and goals that they can actually win now with the resources they have now and begin working towards growing their party, getting those candidates elected, getting those initiatives passed or, or, or at least you know entered into the, the, the public consciousness. Get victories, even small victories, so that we can build on that, that I guess, sediment of or that layer of victories and build towards the next layer of victories and keep building up until we eventually can win the White House, until we eventually can win Senate and, and, and governor's races and everything else. But we have to start where we are and we have to create a blueprint to actually be able to move forward. And that's what I'm working on with uh, libertarians across the country. You know, it strikes me as the, the typical growing pains of a of a movement that very much started off as a bunch of guys that were reading books. And, and I say guys in the literal sense. Uh, yes. It men. was all, it was all dudes. Yep. And, and I'll, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm a little bit younger than that, but I was sort of part of that, um, that first generation of, uh, self-identified libertarians, um, right. uh, getting involved in, in the late 1980s. And even back then, like I, I very quickly didn't want to be part of the LP because all they did was fight with each other. Yes. And I was, I was, I was young and naive, and I thought that my goal in life was to change the world. I still am young and naive in that sense that I want to change the world. Right. Um, where are you on this question? And yeah, like it's, a, it's a, it's a, it is very much um, a process of of giving a community a sense of purpose that's tangible enough. Yep. that people can sink their teeth into it, right? That's sort of grassroots organizing 101. Yep. Um, something that I used to do for a living. Um, but I became a libertarian in 2016 for, for two reasons. One was I didn't, um, I felt like the efforts to turn the Republican Party into a party of liberty, and and we did, we were involved in, in I think, some pretty important races, and we we created guys like, uh, Mike Lee and Rand Paul and and Justin Amash and Thomas Massey and 
and a couple other guys. And, and I would, I would defend all of those efforts to this day. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't defend some other things I did, um, that didn't turn out so well, but the, the, the one reason was that, that it looked like, um, taking over the Republican party for, uh, liberty was not viable anymore, uh, particularly, right. particularly with the ascension of, of Trump as the nominee. But the other thing, and this is this is important to to what I do, and I wonder what you think the balance is. Um, you know, there's there's the mechanics of a party that's built to win and ultimately become a competitive third party and, and a winning right. party, or there's the idea that a political party in politics, particularly presidential politics, is a is a beautiful megaphone and a big soapbox to communicate to. Um, people that are liberty curious, but don't really know what a libertarian is, right. who we are and what we do. Where are you on those two things? Because I, I think the, I mean, it's kind of a chicken and an egg thing. I think, I think you probably need both, but I feel like the communication and, and, and growing our team of communicators is a key part of the strategy too. So I want to say another thing that you did was you brought me to the to the liberty movement um, through Freedom Works when you were with that. Um, I remember you explaining as patiently as you could from sort of a conservative aspect why endless war and endless uh, you know uh, surveillance state creation and endless debt spending under the compassionate conservative brand was a bad idea and wasn't conservative at all and certainly wouldn't protect us or our rights. And it was you and people like Ron Paul and even Walter E. Williams and people like that. And I, you know, I would hear your arguments and I'd say, you know, how, how can you, you know, possibly not want us to fight against the Islamo fascists that hate us for our freedoms or whatever neocon garbage I believe back then. But over time, hearing what you had to say, again, from a conservative or I thought conservative standpoint, I increasingly had no good rebuttal to what you were saying. And then as the actual events that were happening were proving everything you said right, uh, that was what led to my eventually becoming a libertarian. So you, you can credit yourself with that too. When you list the, the libertarians you created, you can you can add me to that list. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll take the blame too, I guess. Yeah, you can take the blame too. The blame and the credit that comes with bringing Spike Cohen to really anything. Um, the question as to whether we should be a megaphone or a political party that is contesting and, and, and fighting to win races. I'm not sure, not only do I not necessarily think those things are mutually exclusive, I think the way that I believe it is you can't have, at least as a political party, you can't have one without the other. You cannot be an effective megaphone that is spreading the message of liberty without ending up getting the people that you wanna get elected, elected, or at least many of them getting them elected. You can't get libertarians elected if you don't change the cultural conversation and move the needle of the debate towards what you want to talk about, or at least go into what everyone's talking about with a different perspective that no one else is presenting. So I'm not sure, you know, if you were asking which one's more important in the immediate, I guess it would be the megaphone because we're not going to win a national race until we bring millions more people into the movement. But I really see those as part, I, I believe they're not just a synergized thing. I think that they're mutually inclusive. I think that they are required to be able to do either um, and, and uh, either required to do either or a, or a natural consequence of, of the other, you know, in order for us to, you know, be an effective megaphone, naturally we're going to get more libertarians elected. And in order to get more libertarians elected, naturally we're going to be more involved in the cultural conversation and winning those debates. So I really think that they're part of the same thing. The, the bottom line is when I look at any of these, you know, moonshot or Hail Mary uh, strategies, get on the debate stage. Well, to get on the debate stage, we have to get 15% or more in however many number of opinion polls. In order for that to happen, we have to change so many people's minds that when they get asked in the in the, in the the poll who they're voting for, even if we're not presented as an option, they still say us, whatever the candidates' names are, uh, in order to, what's the other one? Well, we have to win the White House. Well, again, we have to bring millions of people in. Uh, we have to get on whatever podcast or whatever show or whatever a channel. Okay, great. Again, we need more attention so that we are even a blip on their radar to, to, to get featured in the first place. Um, you know, every single thing goes back to we. So I guess megaphone is the most important, at least right now. Everything goes back to we have to get as many people over to our side. We have to get their attention. We have to present uh, our message in a way that actually connects with them. Uh, we're not naturally, you know, you mentioned a bunch of guys with books. We're not naturally consequentialists, right? We're not libertarian as libertarians because it works. 
we're libertarians because it's right. You shouldn't hurt people. You shouldn't take their stuff. You shouldn't violate people's rights. You shouldn't harm them. You shouldn't take from them. Most people are consequentialists to the extent that they're more worried about, well, how's it going to work for me? How is education going to work? How is healthcare going to work? We need to have good answers for those questions, even when they're asked in a way we don't like. If someone tells us, I believe health care is a right, what are you going to do for, uh, for my health care? Instead of arguing with them over the concept of natural rights, listen to their actual concern. I'm worried about the cost of health care. I'm scared during a pandemic that I'm going to end up in the hospital and lose everything as a result of it address those concerns. We have the best answers. We have better answers for the left than the Democrats have. We have better answers for the right than the Republicans have. We have better answers for everyone. So why are we arguing with people or talking over their heads? Answer their questions. Show them how liberty makes things better for them. And when we do that and we get enough people over to our side, now we can win any election that we want to. Your point is essential. And, and I think what you're getting at is is your willingness to listen to people who didn't read human action. <laughs> such a such a shocking strategy. How dare you? Yes, I, exactly. I assumed our entire strategy was to force everybody, uh, maybe not at gunpoint, to read human action and then get back to us once libertarian, they Libertarian apologism. Everyone has to already know our scriptures first, then we can start having a discussion. Totally. But um, I've, been, I've been fascinated by this process of listening and and you know when I wrote my last book, which was quite a while ago now, I think it came out in 2013. Don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. Yes, that was written for a conservative audience, mm -hmm. and and maybe you were one of them. But but I wanted to translate um, things like the non-aggression principle into common sense things that your mom taught you. Yes, um, because let's be honest, that uh, Murray Rothbard clearly stole the non-aggression principle from his grandma, right? Um, he, and he didn't attribute it to her. Shame on him. Um, <laughs> no, because that's, that's this is not like this is not like a brand new theory that we hatched out of whole cloth. It's it's how humans survive and cooperate and thrive. Yeah. And and we've we've tried to translate that into this exotic theory thing. But but I'm particularly interested now in, in listening to people who are um, Trump conservatives, but also, um, you know, progressives that really were turned on by Bernie. And yep. and I this is another debate that goes on in, in libertarian circles that drives me nuts. You can be uh, a purist, you can be hardcore, you can be the one true libertarian and still want to engage with audiences who will never agree with you on everything. Like this, to me, this is, is uh, about building a coalition where we agree on some really big things and then once we get those things done, we should go fight like cats and dogs on the very fringes of libertarian ideology. I want to have these arguments after we've achieved radical minarchy. Then we can sit down at the table and figure out if we're going to keep going. I'm an anarcho-capitalist, right? So I think that you know there are many exits that come before what I want, which is to slam into the guardrails and run to the beach, right? Like that, there are many, many people are going to want to get off the, the, the train before me. That's fine. Right now, the train's headed off a cliff. So we need to turn the train around, or I guess that's not a good analogy because it's hard to turn a train. We need to turn this vehicle around towards liberty, and we can figure out where we are when we, when we start heading into directions where people want to start getting off the vehicle. We need to accept constitutionalists. We need to accept minarchists, anarchists. We need to accept people from the left and from the right. Anyone who recognizes that we are headed in the wrong direction, which is almost everyone, we need to at least accept them to the extent that we want to have a conversation with them. And if they'd like to vote for our candidates, that's awesome. And if they'd like to volunteer for one of our candidates, that's also awesome. If they want to join their local affiliate, that's great. And if they still think that health care is a right uh, or that, you know, uh, we should still have background checks for guns or we should still have some kind of protections at the border, quote unquote, uh, or that we should still maybe some of these wars are still OK. This isn't who we we aren't choosing who to select for our presidential nominee or even for, you know, a high level nominee or leadership in the party. We're welcoming people in who are still learning our ideas. And the best way to when you get someone into your orbit, you can begin to affect them with your gravity. Most people make their decisions on what they believe about stuff as a direct result of the uh, what they're hearing from their social circles. 
And the more libertarian their social circles become, the more they are just generally hearing libertarian ideas. So we need to bring them in. It, now, if someone's a Nazi or something like that, I mean, I, I, I'm not a fan of gatekeeping, but if someone comes in and they want genocide, we need to make sure that those ideas, make it clear that those ideas are unwelcome, right? There are certain, obviously certain lines, but I think that as a former neocon, as someone who, when I first came to the liberty movement, I'm like, yeah, well, you know, I'm still worried about these Muslims. And, uh, you know, I still think that, uh, you know, we should really be restricting who comes to our country and all of that kind of stuff. I was still welcome to the extent that I understood that most of what government did was bad. And then it was just a matter of, you know, consistently saying, hey, if you didn't like what government did on this, what makes you think you can trust them on this? But that conversation couldn't have happened if people called me a, a baby killing bootlicker and told me to, to you know, to hit their bricks. I wouldn't have been able to have that conversation. So I think it's important to welcome people in. And I think it's also important to present a message that connects with people so that even if they don't think they're libertarian right now, they go, wow, that makes sense. You know, when I'm talking about vaccine passports, it's all well and good for me to go, vaccine passports violate your right to travel freely. Okay, everyone already knows that. But I have to say why that's bad. And if I just say it's bad because it violates your rights, well, then I just won over libertarians. I hope I would have their support against vaccine passports for the most part at this point. I need to explain to everyday normal people who are being inundated with propaganda about how vaccine passports are absolutely necessary to protect them and they're the people they cherish the, cherish the most. I have to be able to explain why vaccine passports are bad and how it enables abuse and how it enables discrimination and how it makes it so that the people who have the least are going to be infringed upon the most and, and not be able to go to stores and things like that. You have to have good answers for these things. And if you find yourself at a point where you can't talk to someone in a way that connects with them, then it's probably best to dis disengage in that moment because more than likely you didn't come here as a perfect libertarian. You came with some libertarian ideas and you've slowly become more libertarian. I'm not saying you, you, you were birthed and hatched as the original libertarian. I'm saying everyone else watching this, not you. Uh, I, I, am the, I, am the, I am the one true libertarian. The one true libertarian, um, but everyone else, uh, yeah. including myself, that, that came in, almost everyone else came in as something else and became more and more libertarian as they got more and more into the movement, and we have to welcome people. You know, from my privileged uh, position, I'm, I'm able to show some empathy for those of you who aren't quite as perfect as I am. That's really kind of you. Um, and I like this, and it gets back to my strategy, and I, I've been quoting Jerry Garcia a lot because, because uh, you know, the the power of the Tea Party movement when it was at its height, when mm -hmm. it was an impactful social movement, was that there wasn't a single top-down, leader-driven um, organization. It was very bottom-up, and there was thousands of leaders, and they each had their part, and there was. There was a lot of diversity and we could have had arguments about everything except we were focused on two or three principles that every one of us um, sp almost spontaneously joined together. And and I, I think, you know, when we argue about like, you know, should we be in the party? Should we try to influence Republicans? Should we all move to New Hampshire and, and start a free state there? Should we just right. focus on culture and stay away from politics because it's corrupt? Um, I, I channel Jerry Garcia and say, do what you want, yeah. but, but do something that's productive and do something that you have a path to, to making a difference. And I think, I think that's conducive to the, to the libertarian mindset. I, I wish we wouldn't fight so much. I don't know why libertarians fight so much. Um, be, and, and maybe it's to your point, like if we, if we could agree on some productive things to do, maybe we wouldn't spend so much time on Twitter trashing each other. This is the natural consequence. This fighting is the natural consequence of two things. Number one, libertarians are naturally uh, averse to consensus. I, I shouldn't say that. They're nat we're naturally averse to being told, this is how it is, so get with the program. No, why? Explain to me why it should be, or I'm not going to do it. I'm reflect reflexively not going to do it because you're telling me that I should do it without giving me a clear reason as to why. And given the track record that we have, you that's not a compelling enough reason. Oh, well, this is how we've always done it. Well, look around. Maybe we should be doing things differently. So there's that. Uh, and But there's also the fact that, again, when you don't give people attainable goals. If I 
again, using a corporate example, if I hired everyone in the Liberty Movement to join Liberty Inc., my new startup to spread the message of liberty, and I go, we are fighting for a world set free in our time and to fight the cult of the omnipotent state, and this is what we believe. Bye, everyone. And I don't give people actual goals of what to do, and no one else does either. And so they start kind of ad hoc trying to figure stuff out, but then they're fighting each other because there's not really a, a, a clear strategy going on. This is what's naturally going to happen. Now, I believe in spontaneous order as much as the next person, but there's spontaneous order and there's having everyone have the same goals, but not giving them any direction. And spontaneous order comes from people taking the initiative. So it's not, oh, it needs to come from the LP National, the LNC, and from Chair Joe Bishop Henchman. It's someone has to do it. So I'm looking around. I am seeing some people do it in local and regional levels. And so I'm working with them to come up with something more resembling a national strategy so that we can identify those goals, give people something to do. You know, um, there are many different groups and caucuses within the party that the, the reason they've been able to have organizational success is because they have actual stated goals, not aspirational goals, specific goals. We're going to win this. We're going to you know raise this much. We're going to increase our membership by this much. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then they win those goals and they have little mini celebrations. Yay, we did it. Now, here's our next goal. And when you do that, now everyone's fighting together or working together. You create a culture of winning instead of a culture of losing. You create a culture of succeeding instead of a culture of, of failure and scapegoating. And that is an important part of this. We also need to drop the strong man uh, uh, that, we're, that we're all searching for. It's interesting that in a party that believes so much in decentralization and, and not having you know, this, this strong figure, Every single cycle, that's part of this, this, this culture of failure. I already have people asking me, are you running in 2024? And I'm sure that Justin Amash and Joe Jorgensen and other people, everyone, even you, I'm sure you even have, everyone's getting, are you running in 2024? You're who we need. You're going to take us to the promised land. And I tell people, no, I specifically, me as an individual human being, am not the different, is not what this party has been waiting for to achieve every goal that we have. And, and no, is neither is any other single person. We can do what we can to try to push the message, and I haven't ruled anything out in the future or anything else, but who cares who's running in 2024 if we haven't gotten hundreds of libertarians, 200, hundreds more libertarians elected across the country? What is the shot that we're going to win the White House if we can't win city council or county council or state rep? Let's focus on what we can actually do. And whatever that looks like for 2024, we'll see when we get there. But let's start working we believe in decentralization. We believe in human action. We believe in working together to uh, voluntarily to towards a, a common goal. Let's focus on that. That's something we can do right now, not 2024, not even April, right? Well, I guess April tomorrow, but not even May. Now we can work on that right now. So let's do that. And that's, that is, and will be my main focus for quite some time. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it strikes me, you know, I've, I've, I've read all of Saul Alinsky and I, I used to quote him in a far less cynical way, but you know, one of Alinsky's rules, and I, I can't remember which one, is uh, tactics that go on too long are a drag, meaning that if you try to do things that your activists don't want to do, it's a drag. And it's, that's sort of this contradiction where um, the other tribes, the Republicans and the Democrats, they, they put all of their eggs into the basket of, we, we need to find this strong leader that will get control of the White House and we'll yeah. change everything, we'll force our will on everybody else. And that strategy doesn't work for us because that's not who we are and that's not what our philosophy reflects. Yep. Um, so localism, like I, I, I love taking words back like localism and community and, 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 and hard work. Like these are, these are, these are our values. Um, they got to apply to our strategy, but I, I don't know about you, I, I assume you're going to answer the same way I am, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. Like I, I think that most Americans are getting fed up with the, the vicious tribalism and the fear mongering and the finger pointing and the, the what about ism that the other guy did it too. Um, but we, we have to sort of represent that, that positive, beautiful, cooperative, welcoming vision that is my brand of libertarianism. That's 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 what I see when I talk about these things. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm all against raging against the machine, and I think I think lockdowns are are very much something we should focus on the human devastation. Mm -hmm. We should focus on the injustices and and all of the awful things that have resulted from that. But let's let's pivot with uh, the kind of solutions you're talking about, 
if you're worried about healthcare education, well, what does it mean to have a free system? This is the difference between being a party and a movement that is primarily against things, which I, I will say 100%, when I came in as a libertarian, I came in against things. I was against the wars. I was against the Fed. I was against taxes. And as I became more libertarian, that just gave me even more things to be against. I'm against the war on drugs. I'm against the war on migration. I'm against, you know, the police brutality. I'm against the the, the school to prison pipeline and the, the use of, of, of slave labor in prisons and all this stuff. I, I, I have this big list of things I'm against. And I realized that when someone is looking for solutions, which is the vast majority of people, they're not just looking for something to be against. They already got a long laundry list of things that they're against. When they're looking for solutions and they look to you and your answer is, I am against this and this and this and this and this, I hate all of it. Even if you have the best reasons why you are against those things, even if what you are saying intuitively makes sense to the person in front of you, you didn't answer their question. What are you for? What are you going to do? And your answer can't just be, I'm going to leave you alone because they've been conditioned to, to associate being left alone with neglect. They've been told their entire lives that they need a strong figure to protect them. They are so conditioned that even when they become libertarians, they're still waiting for the strong figure to bring liberty to the world. The reality is that we need to be able to answer the question, what, how will healthcare work? in a libertarian society? How will free market healthcare work? How will free market education work? And you start by answering how it hasn't worked, but then you have to explain how it does work. When I would talk to clients about why they needed to hire me to do website design for them, I would explain what wasn't working, but I wouldn't leave it at that. I wouldn't say, this is sucks, this is a terrible strategy, hire me. I had to explain what I was going to do or they would have never given me a penny. And we have to apply that to, to anything. Anytime you're trying to, for lack of a better word, sell something, someone on something, you have to explain why they should give you a chance. And we have the best answers. So let's just explain it. Let's explain. I am happy. I'm one of the few libertarians that gets excited, Matt, when someone asks me about, you know, what about the roads? I get a huge smile. Everyone else, oh, my, 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 my roads. I explain what roads would look like in a libertarian society. I explain how much they're being screwed with the current system with roads, and then I explain how we do it. And now they're excited about the roads under a libertarian society. You know, this is how we can do things. We can affect people by explaining to them how our solutions work. And you don't have to choose, you know, I have people that say, you know, do you think you should pull more from the left or from the right? I go to human beings and answer their questions and explain how libertarianism makes things better. And to whatever extent I can at least plant those seeds, I've got someone who at least at the very least understands that we're coming from a good place. And that begins the process of them looking more and more into what it is we believe. And there's nothing magical about what I do. We can all do it every single day. And all it takes is just answering the question. We have the answers, just answer them. Let's leave it there. Um, that was a beautiful rant to end this. Uh... For people who don't know Spike Cohen, where do they find you? Uh, I am on Facebook. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm on YouTube. I'm on Instagram. I'm on TikTok for the kids, but I, I'm not on there nearly long. I need to go on there more. I'm also on Discord, uh, but I only go on there when I'm invited by uh, teenagers and 20-somethings to go on and talk to their tens of thousands of followers. I, I, it's such an interesting uh, uh, culture there in Discord. Uh, so I'm only on there when someone invites me. I do not know how to use Discord. They have to walk me through it. Uh, so the main ways to reach me are on Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, I have a website coming out soon, uh, spikecohen.com. Uh, so that will be available soon. But for now, you can find me on, on any of those four major platforms. I'm also on Float, F-L-O-T-E. Um, and uh, if you uh, follow me on social media, you will hear about my, the upcoming events I'm at. If I'm coming anywhere near you, uh, come out and see me. Come out. I, I always do at least an hour or so of, of Q&A in addition to whatever speeches I'm giving. I want to give people enough uh, plenty of time to ask any questions they have. I'd love to hear what you have to say. I'd love to hear what your questions are and answer them in person. And uh, I look forward to meeting you if, I, if I'm coming to your area. And Matt, I appreciate the opportunity to be on Free the People again. Cool. Good to catch up, man. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. That was amazing. Where can I get more content just like that? It's a great question. You're clearly a discerning consumer of the best content. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. And if you're consuming podcasts, go to Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get them. I'm in. Kibbe on Liberty. Honest conversations with interesting people.